I'm delighted, Jerry, and really honored to be here today, so thank you very much. Um, we're going to talk today a bit about adrenal biology and its relationship to adrenal disease, um, some disclosures, some funding sources, and uh, I really uh, want to thank Dr. Beasley because his talk was illuminating yesterday and uh, in the discussions of endocrinology and history because that's uh, a really important topic for the beginning of my talk today. Um, as is the endocrinology and art, as Orlo Clark, one of my and Jerry's mentors at UCSF, illustrates in his textbook here. Because I've been interested in adrenal hormones uh, and their effect on art for some time. Um, as shown here in the screen by Edward Munch. And I want to start with adrenals in history. It was really Eustatius in 1564 who first, uh, uh, first uh, illustrated the adrenal gland in its rightful place above the kidney in his textbook of human anatomy. In 1543, Vesalius either didn't dissect uh, the adrenal gland appropriately uh, or, of course, he had a rare patient with congenital adrenal hypoplasia, which I doubt because the patient would be dead. Um, but I was in um, Edinburgh about uh, a couple of years ago with Steve Morley, and uh, we went to the um, Leonardo da Vinci exhibit of unpublished works of Leonardo. Um, and we were very curious as to what his dissection skills were like. And I want you to look very carefully at these drawings that we observed. We were convinced that Leonardo in 1508 had actually drawn some tissue above both kidneys here. And indeed, in his other drawings, either this was a mistake on his drawing, or indeed he was drawing suprarenal tissue. Now, it took another maybe 300 years until the adrenal glands made it into, into, the, into the clinical realm when, um, when Addison described the disease that bears his name, Addison's disease for adrenal insufficiency. Um, another 100 years later, Jerry Kahn at Michigan, who was the head of endocrine there, he was credited with the discovery of primary aldosteronism, and the disease bears his name. Well, we went back to those images and looked very carefully, and we swear, we swore that in this one image by da Vinci, that not only was there adrenal tissue above that left adrenal, but there, by golly, was an adrenal tumor. So perhaps we need to think about this more carefully, and I, I suggest to all fellows, publish your work. Because perhaps if Leonardo had published his art back in 1508, this would be appropriately called the da Vinci gland. Okay. You're all familiar with this. 1950, the Nobel Prize given for, given for the discovery of adrenal, um, adrenal hormones. What you may not be aware of is that in 1948, two years before that, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of the pesticide DDT to this guy, Paul Muller. And why is that important? It's important because DDT was sprayed on everything. It was sprayed on our food. Um, it was sprayed on our children. Um, as you'll see here, cover of Life magazine um, here. It wasn't until they started looking at the toxic effects um, of DDT that it was shown to be toxic to what? To the dog adrenal gland. And a derivative of DDT might attain was found to cause adrenal atrophy. Well, with that... That's what spurred the mitotane being approved for the first, as the first ever drug for adrenal cancer in 1959. Now, the challenge here is that although DDT, uh, although mitotane was approved for the treatment of adrenal cancer in 59, DDT single-handedly ignited the environmental movement and it was banned in 1972 by the EPA. So the challenge, of course, is that although DDT was banned, Mitotane is still the only approved drug for adrenal cancer in the world. And so this is a problem. And so in 2003, um, uh, Jerry, myself, Paul Gager, and others, we held a conference that some of you were at to try to have a consensus uh, statement developed for adrenal cancer. And what we learned quite quickly is that not only could we, did we not have a consensus, we barely knew the science being done in the adrenal field, and we really had to go back to step one and try to understand the biology of the disease to generate really hypothesis-driven treatment algorithms uh, in the years to come. And so that's, that's been a pretty steep climb for the last 10 years, but that's what I hope to illustrate uh, in the next 25 minutes or so. Um, I work within the context and on the shoulders we all do of 
some amazing physicians and scientists, most notably endocrine surgeons Fred Collar, Norm Thompson, of course, and Jerry Doherty. Uh, this hopefully you recognize. This is one of the pastel drawings of Norm Thompson that have graced, the, that have graced textbooks and the covers of many surgical and medical journals. Uh, this is the program in 2015, and the base of this program really is the outstanding endocrine surgery team that I truly have the privilege of working with in this multidisciplinary group. Uh, and as we know, and as has been uh, illustrated in other, other talks yesterday, this really requires that research is embedded within a multidisciplinary clinic, and that the clinic really is engaged in, in international collaborative work to advance the causes of rare diseases which are really all endocrine cancers, but mo notably for this talk, adrenal cancer. So we're going to do that uh, now. I'm going to do that in the context of, context of telling a couple of stories out of, uh, out of our group at Michigan um, over the years. So we focus on adrenal cancer, but we, had a, we, we posited that to understand adrenal cancer, um, we really need to understand uh, the normal adrenal biology. Adrenal cancer, of course, incredibly rare, one to two cases per million. Its benign counterpart, the adenoma, quite common. But we, we chose to study the normal adrenal gland as well on the predicate that if we study model systems of adrenal biology over here, I'm going to try to use both screens, but it's tough, that this would be an iterative process. The, the model would teach us about disease over here in humans, and we would learn something about from adrenal cancer that would inform us about what questions to ask. And in that way, we would learn a bit about the genetics of adrenal cancer. Most of us think about um, adrenal homeostasis in the context of the long endocrine loops, the endocrine system. For example, we think about glucocorticoids in the context of the pituitary adrenal axis. We think about the renin-angiotensin system and aldosterone in the context of the renin-angiotensin axis. I'm going to challenge us for the next uh, number of minutes to think about homeostasis as an intrinsic property of every organ, okay? And we're going to look at that. Uh, we think about the adrenal as being organized in concentric zones, outer glomerulosa, middle fasciculata, inner reticularis. As illustrated here, these zones, okay, um, have specified function. Glomerulosa, aldosterone, fasciculata, glucocorticoids, of course. This specified function, of course, as we know but take for granted, uh, is also um, specified by unique histology of each zone. Matter of fact, the glomerulosa and fasciculata are defined by their extracellular matrix. Now, we have, a lot way, we have a long way to go in understanding the role of matrix and homeostasis, but again, each of these zones makes a different hormone. What's, why I'm belaboring this point is that if you think about the... Um, the growth unit of a gland. It's a radial growth unit from out to in. What do I mean by that? Well, we've known for a long time, as a matter of fact, 1938 in this published work, it was, it, was, it was documented that, or at least postulated, that the adrenal grew from out to in, and these guys postulated that the adrenal capsule itself gave rise to the cortex, and that a cell lived its life from out to in and then died at the medullary boundary. It wasn't until about well, a few years ago that this was indeed found to be true. And we spent the last decade or so trying to define this process whereby a peripheral stem or progenitor cell is regulated, differentiates into the different cells of the cortex, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis. And we're going to talk about that today and specifically about the timing, location, and plasticity of these cells. I'm going to show you those cells um, in real time. Uh, we're going to focus particularly on these green ones. These green ones that are embedded really within the glomerulosa. These cells, here's what they look like in a mouse. This is a, these are the cells labeled in a mouse. Red, green. The proliferating cells are in blue. It's these blue cells then that give rise to all the cells of the cortex throughout life. The job of a stem of progenitor cell is to replenish cells of an organ of the cortex as they die throughout life. And a stem cell um, is endowed with two critical properties, self-renewal and multipotency. They're pretty self-evident, but let's just explain what they are quickly. Self-renewal means that a cell must be able to give rise to a complete copy of itself 
so that you continually have a pool of progenitor cells to give rise to the cortex throughout life. Otherwise, you'll deplete them. Multipotency means a stem cell must be able to give rise to every type of cell within the cortex. Multipotent. So we're going to talk about that now. These are those cells again in green here. These are the only cells in the adrenal gland that really proliferate robustly. And these cells are undifferentiated. And it, that, that sh is shown in the white strip of cells on the right side of the screen. These cells don't make aldosterone, the blue cells. They don't make glucocorticoids, the brown fasciculata cells. They make nothing, but they, are, they have steroid potential. Again, the stem cell has two properties that defines them. Let's talk about self-renewal and multipotency. Self-renewal brings us to the, the concept of telomeres. Telomeres, as you know, we'll talk about, they're the end of the chromosome. With each, each time a cell divides, each time it self-renews, the DNA replicates. When DNA replicates every time, it results in short and naked chromosomal ends. When you're short or naked in a, in a chromosomal end, a telomere, that's considered damaged DNA if you're not careful, and it sets up what's called transient P53 mediated arrest, and you either die an apoptotic death, or you go to sleep like Rip Van Winkle called senescence. Telomerase's job is to protect that shortening telomere every time the DNA divides. DNA replicates. So telomerase adds DNA to the end of the chromosome. That's its job. It's unique to proliferating cells, and it's uniquely in that outer zone of the cortex shown here in black. How do you protect the naked end of a chromosome, though? Well, all chromosomes, if you look at, my, at your own shoelace, has a little piece of plastic on the end that this is the aglet of a shoelace. Your chromosomes have an aglet to keep it from fraying. It's called a sheltering complex. And it assembles and disassembles with each DNA replication. Well, we got into this uniquely because of this mouse here. Look at the bottom panel. This is the ACD, adrenocortical dysplasia mouse. You'll notice it has no concentric or radial organization. The cortex and medulla on the bottom are completely interspersed. There's no organization. Okay? And this mouse has adrenal failure. Okay. Uh, compared to the top. Well, Katie Keegan cloned the gene responsible for this adrenal failure phenotype, and lo and behold, it was a component of the shelter and complex, that little end of the chromosome that keeps it from fraying. She posited that, well, if it's lost, you're going to have a you're going to have a naked DNA, and you're going to go into DNA, you're going to go into p53 mediated arrest, and you're going to have a death or or failure of these cells. And she postulated that this indeed, because telomerase is only in the stem cell. This was resulting in stem cell death, stem cell failure, adrenal failure. Okay. Tobias Els came to the lab and wanted to prove that. And he showed that indeed the blue cells on the outer cortex are the progenitor cells. He showed with this blue stain that they were indeed senescing. These mice were suffering failure due to progenitor senescence. So what Toby did is he said, well, if they're, dying of, if they're failing due to progenitor cell senescence due to P53 mediated failure, due to the, the fraying telomeres that have no sheltering complex, I should be able to knock into these mice the P53 null allele, meaning make these mice have no P P53, the ACD mice. So he did that, made these mice, and he posited that he would rescue the adrenal. The adrenal would rise from the dead like Lazarus and would be normal, and to our surprise it was. In the middle orange box shows you the rescue. The adrenal gland was rescued with zonation and with function without P53, consistent with the, with the shelter and complex protecting the telomere in the progenitor cell, these mice having progenitor cell va failure being rescued by th P53 loss. This was fine and good with the following caveat. The progenitors were rescued, but the mice started dying fast. And indeed, as he crossed in the heterozygote and the homozygote allele, these mice died fast and faster than normal. And what he was able to show is they died of the normal P53, which is Lee Fermini, the normal P53 diseases, meaning sarcomas and lymphomas. But guess what? These mice also got adrenal cancer now. Only 5%. But this was exciting to us because it was the first hint that these progenitor cells were important. That they were important for homeostasis, but they were also important for diseases, perhaps where not to be too simplistic, depletion of cells resulted in failure, expansion of cells contributed to adrenal disease like tumorigenesis. Okay? And that's what got us looking more deeply 
um, at the genes involved in cancer that we were then going to explore in mouse models of homeostasis. We focused on three. The Wnt pathway, the IGF pathway, and P53, as I mentioned already. We chose these three because these three were known to be mutated in patients with family cancer syndromes in which adrenal cancer was a card-carrying cancer of that familial syndrome. Wnt pathway overactivation, adenomatous polyposis coli, APC, familial adenomatous polyposis. These folks usually get, they can get benign and malignant adrenal tumors, usually late in life. IGF-2 activation, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, due to loss of imprinting of the IGF-2 locus, resulting in upregulation of IGF-2. This happens usually in kids before the age of 10. Lastly, P53, uh, Lee Fermini, where P53 loss results in adrenal cancer, usually in kids um, when they're young. We and others have since determined other genes involved in familial cancer syndromes in the gray box, but we're not going to discuss them today. Well, most adrenal cancer is sporadic, meaning it's not familial germline where every cell has a mutation and gives you a risk of cancer, like the MENs. Most adrenal cancer is sporadic. One cell, one mutation, and then other mutations in cancer. Well, it turns out the same genes, though, were involved. And we'll talk about the Wnt, the IGF-2, and the P53. And we'll get back to the homeostasis and progenitor cell in a few slides. So let's jump to the human disease then which uh, right now. All this slide is to remind us about is that when you activate the Wnt pathway with a Wnt ligand, beta-catenin gets turned on and it turns on genes. So, when we first looked at our set of adrenal cancers, sporadic adrenal cancers, this is a principal component analysis. Each dot is one cancer. Each dot is 20,000 genes. And it just shows you the relationship of each cancer to each other. On the left side of the screen, you have blue dots, which are the adenomas, and green dots, which are the normals. You'll notice that they look very similar to each other in terms of genetic footprint. The point of this slide is to show you that, of course, as you predict, the cancers are different, however. They're splayed over to the right, and they're, these are the yellow and red dots. The point of this slide is to show you that, that cancer is different, and two, to show you that when you have a Wnt mutation that activates beta-catenin, the Wnt mutation... In the red dots, your signature is different than when you don't have it. First clue. So if we now, if we now look at all these genes in the heat map, where every gene is splayed out and each patient is, is a vertical line here, red is high, green is low for the genes. The, genes, the genes go across this way, each patient's up and down. There's about uh, 50 or so patients here. You'll notice that when you have a Wnt mutation, as I showed in the prior slide, the signature is different. You've got lots of red, red box genes and while, the, while the other adrenal cancers have green boxes. The signature is different. But the, the, the part about this that I want to illustrate is that I told you that Wnt mutations can happen in adenomas as well, and they do, but a Wnt, a Wnt mutation in an adenoma does nothing to its genetic fingerprint. It looks just like normal, as you predicted by the prior slide. So that means that a Wnt mutation is not sufficient to cause adrenal cancer. That's on the predicate, which we'll get to perhaps later, that an adenoma can progress to carcinoma. We and others have now shown that. It's a longer discussion. But if you have a Wnt mutation, it's not enough to cause cancer because it happens in an adenoma too. And indeed, the IGF pathway is, a criti is critical to this process. And indeed, IGF mutations only happen in sporadic adrenal cancer. And when they happen with the Wnt mutation, it's that combination which contributes to that unique signature in the overlap, which is, yellow, which is red. But an IGF mutation, as I mentioned, never happens in an adenoma. P53, it doesn't matter. It doesn't care where, where and when it happens. It can happen with or without either of the mutations. So we got interested in these genes in terms of their role in homeostasis. And I told you about P53 and telomerase already. The Wnt and the IGF pathway, these are both morphogens. They are paracrine factors. And they're critical for stem cell stuff in almost every organ system, the Wnt and the IGF pathway. So the fact that they contribute to adrenal cancer got us excited because we want to then go back and say, what can we learn about their role in a progenitor cell that would be important. So we went back and said, let's start with the Wnt pathway. I'm showing you here now the Wnt responsive cell. 
These are the cells that respond to a Wnt ligand. These cells are under the capsule. Okay? And there they are. What's curious about these cells under the capsule, these are the cells that I've showed you before. These are the progenitor cells, at least in part. We thought. These cells also express and make another very important paracrine factor called sonic hedgehog. The blue cells here on the stage screen right. These cells make sonic hedgehog. Sonic hedgehog, though, talks to cells, sonic responsive cells, which are in the adrenal capsule, the thin line of blue. So this is curious. Why? Because the adrenal capsule, to many of us, was just a piece of saran wrap that surrounded the gland to keep it in. It turns out the adrenal capsule is all the meat and potatoes of the cortex, as it is to many organs. This is the stem cell niche. The capsule is where things are happening. Sonic hedgehog is made in the cortex and talks to capsule, and it turns out wince are made in the capsule and talk to cortex. So you've got this yin and yang going. Sonic talks to capsule, went to the capsule, talks to the cortex. That's all fine and good. We wanted to know how these paracrine factors that are intrinsic to the gland are regulating the gland because we know that angiotensin II regulates glomerulosa and aldosterone and ACHH is regulating fasciculata production of cortisol. How do these factors work together? The Wnt and Sonic are part of that intrinsic homeostatic process and the other hormones are part of the endocrine system. So there's those, there are those Wnt responsive cells in green. Okay? Wnt responsive cells. The sonic hedgehog producing cells are in red. They look the same. The proliferating cells, self-renewing ones, are in blue. When we overlay them, it turns out this is messy, as things are in science and medicine. And indeed, it looks like this in the Venn diagram. Almost every sonic hedgehog producing cell is a winter responsive cell, but the winds are doing a heck of a lot more than just turning on sonic. And indeed, proliferation is happening in mostly neither of these cells, and we still have a lot to figure out. But to the wind cell, we'll get to sonic in a minute. We had a hunch, and we've shown it, others have shown, that the wind, the wind pathway regulates the undifferentiated state of progenitor cells. And what I show you here is that indeed in the adrenal, in a cell-based system, the wince, when you throw on wince, they block steroid production. Even in response to ACTH in the white bar, uh, the wince pathway can shut that down uh, uh, even in response to ACTH. So we know that the wince can inhibit steroidogenesis. We wanted to know a little more, though, about what they were doing in a physiologic and clinically relevant process. We all use glucocorticoids in therapy. We all know that glucocorticoids cause adrenal suppression. Well, indeed, we all actually know that when you give high-dose pharmacologic glucocorticoids, they cause adrenal atrophy. What's that? And then we know the adrenal recovers. How does it recover? Well, it's all about the progenitor cell. Here's that. These are the Wnt cells, again. This is giving dexamethasone to a mouse, like we would give to a patient high-dose glucocorticoids. In red is the cortex. You see the cortex atrophy in the second post-dexamethasone therapy. Then you see, the you see the whole cortex recover in 3 to 14 days. The bottom just shows you cortisol production, the enzymes recovering as well. But you have atrophy of the cortex. What Isabella showed in a series of studies, um, not yet uh, published, is that during following dexamethasone, after the atrophy, look what pathway gets turned on. That's the Wnt pathway, those green dots, after 14 days of dex. The Wnt pathway gets robustly activated. We posited that this pathway is critical for homeostasis, and it's also critical for regeneration. She wondered whether or not it was somehow linked to the sonic hedgehog pathway, that they must be working together. The red bar shows you activation of the Wnt pathway after atrophy in the cortex, the blue line shows you activation of the sonic pathway in the adrenal capsule. So this is odd, because we still didn't think the capsule did a darn thing, but the capsule is like turning on. We thought it was just this layer of mesenchymal cells still. So the cortex and capsule are turning on, and indeed, wind 
is turning on the cortex and Sonic must be turning on the capsule. So the question that we asked is, is Sonic Hedgehog turning on the Wnt pathway? Well, there's the Sonic pathway being turned, there's Sonic Hedgehog being made, that big thickened blue line in the second box is Sonic being turned on at the same exact time that Wnt is being turned on after Dex atrophy. These guys, it turns out, are regulating the regeneration, and I'll show you. There's that sonic cell, sonic producing cell, thick, thick line, turning on the capsule, thin line. What Isabella did, this is not for the faint of heart, for uh, the fellows and trainees. This is a six-year experiment that has not been published yet. The sonic hedgehog is turning on the capsule. To ask the question, is sonic turning on went in the capsule to activate regeneration, she made a very interesting mouse. She made a mouse whereby the sonic pathway was constitutively active, but only in the sonic active cells in the adrenal capsule only. So she had a mouse where the adrenal capsule was always turned on in terms of the sonic pathway. That thin line of blue in the capsule. When she did that, here's what happened. She interestingly saw in the lower right a thick activation of the Wnt pathway under the capsule, commensurate with a robust activation of proliferation under the capsule, the green dots in the left lower panel. So activation of the capsule, Sonic Hedgehog turns on Wnt and proliferation in the cortex. She then did a microarray, and without going into it, because you can't see it anyway, she showed that when she did that, the sonic turned on Wnt ligands in green and shut off Wnt antagonists. These are made in the capsule. So sonic turns on Wnt is the case point of this story. She then did it pharmacologically to prove to me that these experiments weren't some artifact of uh, some artifact. So she then gave a drug that blocked sonic hedgehog signaling. This is a drug used in the clinic for some basal cell carcinomas that are activated by sonic hedgehog. She used a sonic inhibitor. She turned off the capsule. The blue in the capsule gets turned off with this inhibitor. And lo and behold, when she did that, the hedgehog pathway was turned off on the left. And indeed, she shut off the wind pathway. Most impressive, however, to me was that she completely reversed and prevented regeneration, as shown here in the lower left. She blocked regeneration and the ability to regenerate corticosterone, not cortisol in the mouse. So it looks like Sonic Hedgehog and Winter are talking to each other, whispering to each other, capsule to cortex, cortex, cortex to capsule, and that that is at least in part what's responsible for that regeneration of the cortex following dexamethasone therapy. So let's move on then with a the discussion. If this is true, and that the Wnt's, Wnt's job is really just to respond to Sonic, that when, you re, when the adrenal atrophies, the adrenal atrophies uh, that Sonic gets turned on and it's trying to talk to the capsule and the capsule is trying to turn on the wind pathway so you can make more cortex so you can respond to ACTH. If that's true, then we should be able to make a mouse where you just play around with the wind signaling and it does the same thing as Sonic because wind is just downstream of Sonic. Right? So we did that. So Alex Kim, who's now a surgery fellow at Michigan, after his PhD, he decided to become a surgeon. Uh, with, uh, with the surgery group at Michigan. And uh, for Alex's PhD, he knocked out wind signaling only in the adrenal gland, another uh, pretty tough experiment to do. When he did that, while we predicted that perhaps we would have a decrease in regeneration of the gland, here's what happened. Without wind signaling in the adrenal gland, at birth, the adrenal looks completely normal. <clears throat> but let me tell you what happens. At birth, the adrenal is normal. But after about a year, the adrenal, the whole cortex does this. You have to watch my hands. The adrenal cortex just shrinks down to nothing, and you're left with a capsule and a small rim of cortex. And what Alex proved in his thesis was that the adrenal fails due to progenitor cell failure in the absence of Wnt. The cells can't self-renew, and that's the role of the Wnt pathway in normal homeostasis. It helps the telomerase pathway in terms of self-renewal of these cells, and without it, the cortex fails. What if you do the reverse? What if you make a mouse and you make the Wnt pathway constitutively active and on only in the adrenal cortex? Well, we hoped we would just see. We hoped we would just see enhanced regeneration. Well, we made that mouse. 
uh, Ferdos Barlas car, an MDPS2 student in the lab, did that. And when he made the wind pathway constitutively active, we didn't just see enhanced regeneration. We saw, curiously, um, when you do this, progenitor cell expansion. Those progenitor cells expanded, kept on expanding, um, and we saw hyperplasia and ultimately adenoma formation in the adrenal cortex, presumably from these progenitor cell clusters. In one mouse, so, in, in, so activating the wind pathway is not the same as activating sonic, as we should have predicted. Life is never so simple. Okay? In one mouse only, out of many, many mice, we saw this, a large tumor. The normal adrenal is that little tiny nubbin over uh, where it says adrenal wild type. This one, and most of these microadenomas were tiny little adenomas in that mouse adrenal. This thing looked larger than the kidney. And Ferdos posited that, well, there must be a second hit going on here. And he posited that the second hit was what was IGF-2. I said, no, it's not going to be that simple. Well, I'll be darned, he looked at IGF-2, and in that adrenal only, and in none of the adrenals of the other 50 mice, IGF-2 was twofold upregulated, just like you see in beckwith wiedemann syndrome, just like you see when you get an, uh, uh, a second IGF-2 hit in adrenal cancer. So, Ferdos then spent three years making a mouse that had the beckwith wiedemann IGF-2 mutation with only mutation, with only a mutation in the locus control region of the IGF-2 locus, like you see in Beckwith, and only in the adrenal cortex. When you make that mouse that has the beckwith wiedemann mutation only in the adrenal gland, the adrenal looks completely normal. So we crossed it to the Wnt mouse. Why? Because I showed you those patients. I talked about Wnt and IGF being part of the familial cancer syndromes. I talked about Wnt and IGF being mutated in familial cancer syndromes where adrenal cancer was a card-carrying cancer. And I showed you that the Wnt mutations can result in adenomas and carcinomas. And I showed you that the IGF mutation only happens in sporadic ACC, never in ACA. So, he, so for those who want to prove this genetically, that by crossing both mutations in, okay, we would see that when these progenitor-regulated genes okay, were both mutated, we now didn't just get adenoma, perhaps we'd get something worse. Like in that one giant tumor in the mouse, remember that one giant tumor was a mouse with a genetically engineered wind mutation with a spontaneous IGF-2 mutation. Now we're going to try to prove it genetically. And he did that. And here's what he saw. Purple is, is IGF only. Blue, wind only. Red is both. It goes from normal to carcinoma, from right to from, uh, whatever, left to right. These are young mice. These are middle-aged mice. You'll see that already you're having things happen earlier, and you're seeing much, m many more macroadenomas in the double mice. And lo and behold, we now see bona fide adrenal cortical carcinoma when both mutations are added into the adrenal gland of these mice. So this was satisfying uh, because it suggested that indeed these two genes, which we know are critical regulators of stem and progenitor biology in the adrenal gland, and regulate self-renewal uh, and the undifferentiated state of an adrenal are mutated in adrenal cancer, and together uh, they participate in what I'll call, for lack of a better term, oncogenic synergy in terms of uh, cooperating to go from a normal gland to adenoma to carcinoma through a progenitor fate. Okay. Why is this important? Now we'll get to the translational piece in the last five minutes. We talked about IGF-2 being upregulated in 90% of ACCs. Well, I, the IGF pathway is a wonderful potential drug target. Why? Because it's a ligand. And it's a ligand, and so you can antagonize its membrane receptor. It makes it, in a sense, easier to target. There are Wnt antagonists on the market, on the, uh, in the pipeline as well. They're not as advanced as the IGF ones were a few years ago when we started this. So, Ferdos first took this into a preclinical model. I won't go into this in detail, these kind of graphs. But uh, these are human, uh, this is a human ca uh, adrenal cancer cell line in green. It's growing in a mouse, uh, in a xenograph. And you'll see that mitotane does very little in orange, but this drug, with or without mitotane, completely suppresses xenograph growth, which is a, a little preclinical pearl that, huh, 
at least in a preclinical model, the IGF pathway can target adrenal cancer and inhibit its growth. But this led to, after a lot of arm twisting of drug companies, a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three trial of IGF inhibition for adrenal cancer. And, and the take home message of, uh, of getting folks interested, drug companies interested in, in endocrine cancers for all of us is we have to do the science. We have to know the genetics and you have to know the science because up until recently, as we all know, very few of the companies uh, have interest in rare cancers because the return on investment is just not enough. But if you have the science and biology, you can make a much better case. And so here's the IGF story. So three, three trials. <clears throat> here's the phase one data, which was published a few years ago in collaboration with Paul Haluska and the Mayo Group. In green, this just shows you tumor shrinkage. Blue is tumor, uh, is tumor growth. This, this just shows you that in a, a, a nice number of patients, there was biologic activity. I say that cautiously. Yes, we saw shrinkage of tumor. That was, uh, that was relatively uh, short-lived, but we saw a biologic effect. This led to a phase two trial sponsored by, uh, with another uh, IGF inhibitor, sponsored by the NCI. Um, and in this particular trial, which was finally published, we again saw significant effects in a small percent of patients, but real effects. Okay. This led to a phase three trial, or a concomitant phase three trial, where, um, uh, which was, this is a real testament to the endocrine surgery community, the endocrine oncology community around the world. This trial was 46 sites around the world, 139 adrenal cancer patients enrolled within a year and a half to two years. And in this adrenal cancer trial, this was a placebo-controlled trial for adrenal cancer with IGF-2 inhibition. And the results are, um, which were just published, <coughs> here. To the, drug, to the drug company, a failure. Okay, To me, not a failure, but a very small beginning of a success. <laughs> Meaning, the right-hand side of the panel shows you the responders. Again, a small percentage, maybe 10% of patients, 7% had real response long-lived. These responses, though, are two, these patients are still on drug. This is two, three years later. These patients had failed everything. Okay? So what does this tell us? This tells us we have a long way to go, but you need to do the science first. It also tells you that the genes that may initiate a cancer don't necessarily continue to drive it. IGF and WINCE are important. They're important for homeostasis. They help initiate these cancers, we think. But other mutations happen as well. Most adrenal cancers have multiple mutations, 10, 20, 30 mutations. We have to figure that combination out to find the right lock and keys. But while the drug companies have dropped IGF in adrenal, if we can figure out what defines a responsive patient, we can use this drug. Meaning 90% of patients have this mutation, it only works in 7%. Like non-small cell, right, with the ALK mutation? Well, it's sub 10% of patients have the mutation, but you can use the drug because you know who's going to respond. If we know what patients will respond to this drug, we will be able to use it, I predict. So that's where we're headed. And so there's a patient with a complete resolution of lung mets in this cohort. Again, small, small percentage. So the question really is, where do we go from here in my closing two minutes? Well, we have to work together, is what I mentioned. We, uh, we're formalizing, uh, the Europeans have formalized the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors in October. We'll be formalizing the uh, Pan-American Australian Adrenal Network that we urge you all to participate in. Um, this will be a shared database and repository um, where we will all be able to uh, collaborate as we, uh, as we are already doing, but in a more robust fashion. I'm going to show you one example of these drivers. This is the TCGA project, the Cancer Genome Atlas, sponsored by NCI. As you may or may not know, they, the NCI took on... Um, took on the major cancers to sequence 250 to 500 of each tumor type. Um, they appropriately did not take on any rare cancers, but uh, uh, a credit again to this community, the first cancers they took on that were rare, or some of the first, were thyroid cancer, pheochromocytomas, and adrenal cancer, right? Thanks to you all in this room and our, and our colleagues around the, the, the country and the world, really. So the TCJ cohort, which is unpublished yet, looks like this. 
No, we're not going to go through this in detail. This is called the landscape shot. that just shows you all the mutations. I want to just point to these, what we think are, are, are very important uh, initiating mutations, perhaps. Uh, and some of them are new. Our old friends, uh, the Wnt pathway and IGF are represented. Um, but there are also some new ones. And to, to our, to our, our and so is P53, to our, uh, not surprised, to our good fortune, telomerase is represented. So this gets back to our initial idea that the stem cell biology is important. IGF, the Wnt, telomerase. Uh, some of the new players here are telomerase, are telomere binding proteins in green, which regulate, again, the shelter and complex. And ZNRF3, which is, ZNRF, oh, ZNRF3, which is a, um, the top one, which is mutated in up to 20% of patients with adrenal cancer, a new mutation that is part of the Wnt pathway. So up to 50% of patients have a Wnt mutation. And that one is targetable, ZNRF3, because it works at the membrane. I would be remiss, of course, to say this is unpublished and the TCGA was beaten to the punch by both the NSAID group, uh, the above snapshot, and the wonderful work of Tobias Carling at Yale, the bottom group, who also showed those same gene profiles recently published uh, as drivers, we think, for adrenal cancer. Xenorf 3 and telomerase are really exciting to us because they're involved in stem cell biology. So we're going back to the drawing board. We're going back to the mice, going back to understanding the role of these these genes and pathways and normal biology so we can get insight into pathogenesis and lead us back to therapies that target the Wnt pathway, telomerase, and the IGF. So we have some hypotheses about how they're working, which I won't go into, but back to homeostasis. So in the closing one minute, um, I'm going to leave you with a short uh, video, please. So this is an iterative process, of course. An iterative process, bench to bedside, mouse to human, uh, disease to homeostasis, right? And I'm going to ask you the following question in closing. What can the adrenal teach us about uh, homeostasis and cancer and about life? Well, look what it taught this guy. Being diagnosed with low adrenaline levels was devastating. No one ever warned me about adrenalitis, so I never saw it coming. There's times when you need adrenaline, and I didn't have it. That's when a friend who had beaten adrenalitis recommended the all-new 245 horsepower V6 Toyota Tacoma with the TRD package. Knocked it right out. That truck saved my life. The all-new Tacoma. Now that's moving you forward. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. <laughs>